All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Andrews Forster, and uh, I'll be talking today on getting a handle on Postgres extensions. So first, a little bit about me. As I said, my name is Andres. Um, I work for a company called GoodX Software. We're one of the sponsors here. Um, I've been working for GoodX for about 15 years now, and um, from of that 15 years, I've had about um, 10 years' experience with Postgres. Around about the time 8.2, 8.3 8 <laughs> came out, uh, we started using Postgres. And uh, one of the reasons I love this DB so much is um, uh, the previous talk I was in, he said it so well, is your imagination is basically the limit to what you can do with, with Postgres. Um, and uh, one of those things is the extensions. So basically what we'll be covering today is what are extensions and where to find them, um, how to install an extension, uh, basic, in basic extension installation versus a little bit more uh, intermediate to advanced installation of an extension, and then some of the extensions that I've personally used, and, um, and then we'll just go into a little bit, of, a little bit into that, and then uh, if there's enough time left, we'll have a little bit of Q&A. So, what is extensions? Um, as if Postgres couldn't do anything already, um, all of these smart people, they decided, no, this isn't, what, this, isn't, this isn't the thing for me, it's not what it's supposed to do, I want to do something else. So they wrote an extension. So an extension is basically an add-on that can either modify an existing um, part of Postgres or it can uh, purely create a new one. And with these, we can see um, comes user-defined, um, it's not limited to user-defined data, data types, functions, or operators. So uh, if we go on from there is where can you find them? So some of them, a majority of them, they are shipped with a standard installation of Postgres that you can find by, via um, EDB or Big SQL, those installations, so they're in the contrib folder. Uh, or you can build and install the extensions manually um, that you would then have to download an extension from a uh, multiple websites. Uh, one of them is uh, pgxn.net. There's a list of uh, extensions there. I haven't done this personally yet, um, but I know you can do that. Um, some of the cloud-based solutions like Citus Data or uh, AWS, um, they offer extensions uh, primarily for their clients, or as I heard in the previous talk, you can actually write your own. <laughs> uh, haven't done that as well. So now the next question is, why aren't they standard? Well, usually they only cater for a small part of the community. That's um, very like a niche type thing. Um, and some of them are actually experimental, so they aren't like trusted very much inside of the core of Postgres. So uh, today, um, we use Postgres 9.5 in our production environment. So um, I've only had to do um, with the Postgres 9.5 contrib module. So there's no downloading or building or writing your own extensions in this talk. It's purely just um, some of the extensions. And uh, there you can see there's a whole list of extensions that come together with 9.5. There's the list of 44 extensions. I think uh, 9.6 has 46 or 47 extensions, and they go on and on and on. Um, so, and these ones are actually, um, there's a full list of extensions, as you can see there at the bottom, uh, 9.5 contrib module, and um, that's actually my, the main resource of my talk. So, installing an extension, um, so all of the extensions I am, I'm going to talk about today um, is part of the contrib folder, so there's no additional modules to download or anything. You can just carry on straight from a uh, SQL command window and just run the create extension, and then your module name, which is there, you can see create extension uh, dblink. Um, if it's part of an init script, you can add the uh, if not exists, um, and then it'll just, um, if the extension exists, it'll just pass through it. Um, and then if you're a little bit um, OCD, where um, it basically, um, if you do a create extension, it creates a, all the additional views or uh, functions it will create in the public schema. Where, uh, so if you want to take that out of the public schema, you can create your own contrib schema and then say create extension 
your module name and then the schema where you would like that to go into. So if you really want to, you can create an extension for, or create a schema for each of your extensions and let it run or create it into that extension or into that schema. Um, and yes, you would have to create this on every database. In your cluster, or if you have a cloud-based solution, you would have to create that on every database. Um, some of the extensions, they are cross-database compatible, like PGStat statements, um, but for primarily most of the extensions, they, you, have, you would have to create them for each database, or you can create all of your extensions in your template one database, which is the template that Postgres uses for the creation of new databases, and then from there, um, you know, if you create your new database, it'll just add it into there. Um, so as I said, some of the extensions require, that's a basic, uh, the basic creation of an extension. Some of the extensions, like uh, PGStat statements, um, require you to um, change the PostgreSQL.conf beforehand, um, so that it actually, because it's a cross-database um, extension, um, each time you have to, each time you make a connection, it'll have to add that extension into your library. Um, and then there, so there you would then add the extension name in your shared preload libraries, and uh, then you would have to uh, restart your server in order for you to uh, use that extension. Um, uh, there's just like um, uh, information if, if you want to see all, the, all of the extensions that you have installed on your database. Uh, the first one there is a PSQL command where you can just say slash dx. It'll give you, it gives you the list of installed extensions, or you can do a query where you just say select star from PG, uh, PG extensions, and it gives you the, it's pretty much the same view, um, so depending on what you want to use, you can use that. So basic, uh, this is today where that, we, that we're actually just going to go into a little bit of depth. Um, the file FDW extension, DBLink, uh, Postgres FDW, PG stat statements, and PG trigram. Um, there's a whole other list of extensions um, that we also use, but uh, these are actually quite the, the nice ones. <laughs> so first is the PG stat statements, um, as we heard Hans speak about. Um, this is actually a pretty, pretty cool tool to use um, if you don't want to pay a lot of money to buy an enterprise product like Vivid Cortex or Datadog or something like that. That this is a, something that you can use, sorry, out of the box where um, it basically this is a cross cross cluster cross database extension. So you would then have all the statistics over um, you know all of your databases. So if you have one application that runs separately on 20 different databases, you can actually see the, um, uh, see all the stats from all the databases combined into one. So for your installation, you would then have to go into your um, postgresql.com file, add the PG stat statements um, to your shared preload libraries tag, and then restart the server. So now that it's now that your server's restarted, you can go into a query window, say create extension, PG stat statements, and it will create your extension for you. This you would only have to do once on one database, so you can connect to the Postgres database or your own database, create the extension, and the stats will keep on coming, or stats will start rolling in. There's some, excuse me, there's, a, there's some uh, extra additional configuration that you can use or can set. Um, my experience is the, the default values there is sufficient enough for you, so um, I'm not going to go into very uh, into much detail about that, but that you would then also add into your postgresql.com file. Um, you can add it anywhere in the file, um, and then obviously uh, you would have to restart your server as well. So um, this is almost the same query as uh, the one that Hans showed us um, to see what is my most, this is just a, an example of the query that took the most time on my database. So there we can see the query amounted to 3,000 calls, totaling up to, uh, was that 400 millisec 4,000 milliseconds. So it's not very big, but there we can see our slowest query. And what's nice about this, um, it takes, um, the first time the query pops up in your, in your query planner or in your, stat, in your stats, um, it will give it a query ID 
and then from there all the queries that are similar to that. So there we can see the uh, the dollar one sign and the dollar two sign. So all the variables it would then take and replace to normalize the query so that you can actually see this type of query is slowing up your DB or it takes the most amount of time and stuff like that. So stat statements and this is actually a PG stat statements view. It comes with your, um, so if you create the extension, it'll automatically create this view. Okay. Um, sorry. So the next extension that um, I came across is PG trigram. So PG trigram is a, gives you a list of, uh, it basically splits a word or a string up into parts of, uh, into three characters per part. So, and that would actually, um, it helps you a lot with um, uh, like a sounds like, or if you, you know, some people spell the name John, G-H-O-N, other people spell it G-O-H-N, um, G-O-N. So with trigram, it splits that up and it basically does a similarity max or, or similarity match between the two between the two words. So it's basically like a mini Google search bar within your database. Um, so this is a, also, this is a straight out of the box installation. You would just do create extension PG trigram and your extension is good to go. No need to restart servers, no need to do anything. This, however, you need to do on all of your databases that you want to use it. So this now, it doesn't give you any, any views or any new data types or stuff like that. It gives you new functions. So there we would say, the, um, just an example, show trigram. So there you would see I did a trigram for Postgres and for Andres. And then that basically splits it up into three parts um, um, or three. It gives you basically the array of everything. Um, and then... So to use it, you would then do a select similarity, that is a function to see how similar the two words are to each other. And here we can see um, it gives you a value between zero and one, zero being a no match at all and one being an exact match. So there we would see a similarity between Andres and Postgres is only a value of 0 0.0625. Uh, other functions, um, we get the, I'm just going to jump down to the bottom one, the, the percentage operator is a new operator that you can use when you, install the, when you install the extension. That basically does a similarity in the background for you and returns uh, a true or a false if it is um, above the uh, similarity limit. The similarity limit then there at the top is a, you can do it by a show limit. The default there is 0, is 0 0.3. Um, so, which is relatively loose. Um, so, if you want to uh, be a bit more strict in your queries with a percentage operator, then you can um, up that as well. This, is, this can also be set per session. So, the default is uh, 0 0.3, but in your session, you can set it to 0 0.67 or whatever. And then when your session is done, the next session is automatically at 0 0.3. So, just an example there at the bottom, we see our show limit is 0 0.3. We did a similarity between Andres and Postgres, um, and we did a similarity between um, Andres and Andreas as well, and there you would see the similarity for Andres and Postgres is only 0 0.06, so that would return a false, whereas Andres and Andreas is a 0 0.33, and then that would return a true. So if you do a similar or do a percentage match on, your, uh, on the columns in your table, it would then basically get a true or a false. Um, so now the next one is you can actually add a gin or a gist index on your column or multiple. So you can add multiple columns in your, in your index. So let's say you have a table with a name, surname, and an ID number. Then you can add a trigram index um, using gin and then your field name there within the T where it says the T there, then you would have name. It's a gin trigram ops comma um, Surname, trigram, ops, and then, um, and then that basically. So you don't have to necessarily always use it. It would hit the index when you use a like or an I like as well. So it's not just with the percentage operator that gets added with this. So, and that's actually pretty fast. Um, just side note, it is a very large index because as we saw in the previous slide, and the word Andres gets split up into, I don't know, 10 or 15 trigrams. 
So just uh, caution <laughs> if you want to create um, one of these indexes with multiple fields. So the next one is um, file FDW. It's a file foreign data wrapper, which, and this extension extends one of the already existing um, things in Postgres, and it extends the copy from method where you would copy data from a file, um, a file on disk, <coughs> excuse me, a file on disk into a table. So this is also, um, it's a little bit more um, setup required. So you then automate, do the create extension file FDW that would then create the extension and gives you access to the file FDW foreign data wrapper type. So, and then you would then say create server, you can give that, you would only have to do this once per database, and then create files, foreign data wrapper, using your file FDW um, foreign data wrapper type. So this just basically gives you a little bit more structure in terms of having to, so there at the top you would see that's your normal copy from method. So usually we would then create a temporary table or a static table. Um, copy temp table, test from the path to some files and do your options where that's the file name, your header, format, the delimiter, quotes, all that uh, extra options that you have at your disposal with a copy from. But um, yeah, so and then so with the foreign data table, you would then create a static table where you don't have to, so what basically the copy from does is actually physically copies the file from, or copies the data from the file into the table and then you would have to go and select the table uh, afterwards, after you've copied the data into the table. So with the, uh, the foreign data, the foreign table using the file FDW is if the file is on disk and you select from the table, it'll, it'll display the data. Um, so it's a bit quicker, so it's not, not two or three or four operations, it's basically one operation. And then there at the bottom you will see, you would create a normal, that's a syntax creating a foreign table. Um, your, all your columns, that's basically your columns in your, in your, let's call it a CSV file, in your CSV file. And then your options there at the bottom would then correlate to your options that you would use in the copy from method. So, and if the file doesn't exist anymore, it's just gonna give you an error, an exception that says the file doesn't exist. This is also only a one-way traffic, it's read-only, so you can't do an update on your foreign table writing back to the CSV. It's only a copy from, not a copy to. Okay, so that's one part of a foreign data wrapper. Now, it gets a little bit more, this is a, actually quite a cool extension, it's called dblink. So this gives you the ability to, from within a session on database one, to execute queries and updates, inserts, select statements on multiple different databases without leaving your session. So without having to write, and this is uh, quite a pretty cool extension if you have data warehousing and stuff where you need to get data from different databases and aggregate them in your warehouse. So this is a bit old. There is a new extension that's got a little bit more structure to it. It's called Postgres FTW, but we'll get to that. So just gonna take you through DBLink and how it works, and then you'll be able to understand um, the Postgres FTW a bit better. So this is also just a create extension command DBLink. This you would also only have to do from so let's say you have your warehouse database, you would only create the extension on your warehouse database, you don't need to create it on all 400 different databases. So only your source database and then your target databases don't need, don't need to have the extension installed on them. Um, so if you create, if you do a create extension DB link, there's a whole list of, I think 20 odd functions that gets created that you can use. Um, and then, but I'm only gonna actually take you through four of them. Okay, so to establish a connection from a, an existing database, you would then use the dblink connect. This, um, this uses the, uh, or the connection settings, or the connection string um, is used by the libpq client library. 
So, um, and it's basically the same as where you would want to connect to a PSQL connect with a dash username and DB name. So, you would then use dblink connect, give your connection a name. So, there we can see we gave a test connection, DB name, your host name, port, uh, you can give it a connection timeout, your user, and your password. So if that is successful, it will return a OK for you. If it's not successful, it's either the test connection name has already been used or you have an issue in your connection string. To get a list of DBLink connections, so this you would then do from your current session, so then we can actually connect to monitor DB2, 3, 4, and you would then have a list of three or four connections. To get your actual active connections, um, you would use dblink get connections that would return an array of current active connections from your session. So if I open a session, open dblink connect, and Justin opens a session, dblink connect with the same, it's, it's private to your session. So you can have um, multiple session names across multiple sessions, but not the same connection name within one session. And then, so this is one of the functions. Um, it's called dblink exec. Um, what that basically does, it, it executes a, an insert, update, or delete query on your target database, um, and it does not return any rows. If you do a dblink exec with a select query that gives you rows, you're going to get an error. So basically, this is just to purely do updates or um, deletes or inserts. So there we can see um, on our monitor DB, we would then create a table, dblink test, and then we would connect to the pgconf2019 one and do a insert from the test connection that, cre that we created in the previous slide and do an insert onto, into the dblink test table, connect to the monitor DB, and then we would see our values. So that's, I think it's pretty cool that you can do it from one session. Um, so now, in the previous slide, we actually connected to the MonitorDB to retrieve the data. So now with dblink, that's the other function, same thing, pass your connection, but now you can actually retrieve data. So you don't have to actually connect to your target database. You can use, sorry, you can use that, uh, your connection function, or your, you can use the dblink to actually return data for you. Um, here it returns a set of record. So if you, so in the first example, we have select count star from dblink test. Now that would return a column of integer or whatever the data type was, or it would return an integer column for us. So now we would have to give that column name an alias and a data type. So you can do, you can use any, um, your aliases can be anything as long as the data type matches the data type of the columns returning, then you can do anything. So there we would then see, uh, we said, okay, do it as dbq, and our set of record is recnum, and that is an integer, and then we would see there's a, there's a list of, or a total number of nine rows in our db. So the next example is, so in our previous table, we would see, oh, in the previous slide, we would see the table is main id, the column name main ID and column one. So in our second example, we would then see select star from dblink test where our main ID is less than five, but our set of record aliases, we define my ID and my text as the column names, but the data types are the same. So then our result set would be my ID and my text. So if you, would, if you use the dblink you would then obviously use the same column names just to be more consistent throughout, but that's just an example to show you that your, your column aliases can be um, anything you want them to be as long as the data types are the same. So now we actually get to what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> the Postgres FDW. So this allows you to exactly the same as dblink, but it's more structured, it's got more guidelines. And um, so with the dblink and dblink execute and um, the dblink connect, that is more consistent throughout. So here you would then say uh, create extension Postgres FDW 
for the foreign data wrapper that, that's also just on your source database. And then from there on, you can create multiple servers that you want to connect from, from that database. Um, there's a little bit of extra preparation that is required. So DB Link is kind of like an on the fly, connect, disconnect type thing. Um, whereas the FDW is more of a consistent connection. So you would then have a create server, create user mapping, and then you can create your foreign objects uh, and uh, create or import your foreign objects. So that's basically the steps that you want to follow when setting up a Postgres FDW. Um, creating a server, creating a user mapping, and then, then you can um, create your SQL objects from there. So first is we would then create our server. That is the top is there is the syntax that we want to use. And then at the bottom there's an example. The foreign data wrapper is actually not just for Postgres. You can use the, that link there at the bottom is actually, um, that doesn't come standard. So there's a little bit of more tweaking and setup. So from a Postgres server, you can use a SQLite or Oracle or MySQL foreign data wrapper. So you can connect from Postgres to the MySQL database in a session, get your data. And so you can do that. And uh, that I actually only found out about two weeks ago. So I haven't started playing around with that, but I think that is pretty cool. Um, so they will then say create our server, which is our foreign server towards our, to our monitor DB. We are on the PG2019 DB. And we would then, as with the, the um, file FDW, we would, we, we would use the file foreign data wrapper. Now we would just use the Postgres foreign data wrapper. And um, there your options, it uses the same um, as the DB link, the libpq library. So here you would only say your host, your DB name, and your port. So no user credentials. So on the next one, then you would create a user mapping for that server. So there you would, um, the possibility is there to not just have a super user, but have a read-only user give access so that it can uh, run the, uh, the data warehouse queries, or if you want to insert, then you would give a user insert rights. So then you would say create a user mapping for Postgres, and you would want to connect. So Postgres is a super user. And then your options there, so if you have a read-only user that you only give access to your um, read-only database, then you would put your read-only users databases there. So the current user there is the current user that you connected with onto your current database. And then you will want to connect as this user, connect as an alias to the Postgres um, or to the um, foreign, foreign database. So in DBLink, you would then basically, so DBLink connect is you would have your whole connection string in there for your database. Um, so now in uh, DBLink versus your Postgres foreign data wrapper, you would then have a create server and a create user mapping to, that's basically what DBLink is. So this then, if you use PG admin in your tree list view, um, you would then see your foreign servers and your foreign users and everything in there. So that is static then. Um, so it's only, only when you use a query a table or a function or a view on the foreign table, it would then utilize the connection or make the connection and then it would show up on your stat activity where if you don't use it, it's not in your stat activity. Okay, so now we get to a, the create foreign table. So the create foreign table there is just an example of, so you would then create a, let's say the, the DB's name is monitor DB. So we're on the PGConf 2019 DB. We have a monitor DB. You would then create a monitor schema, or you can put it in a public schema or, well, or the schema of your choice. Um, create the test foreign table. So that is a table name of your choice. And then from there, you would then so do the, select the columns. What server are you using? And the options. So what is your foreign table's name? So on the, the monitor DB, we have in the schema, in the public schema, we have a DB link test table. So what happens in the, in the first instance, if you would select from my schema dot test foreign table, it would then make a connection to the monitor DB and retrieve column main ID and column one dot text and show it. So it's basically like the, 
the file FDW with a DB link. Um, and so uh, just there at the bottom, the example that we used, that's what the example would look like if you would use DB link. Um, and then we can use the same example where we only want the first column, the main ID column or sorry, the text column. So there would then basically be um, select, oh, sorry, that bottom example is wrong. There we would have select column one from our DBLink test table. So you can, um, the only thing here is with DBLink, you could give your column names aliases like you want. With the Postgres foreign data wrapper, the column actually needs to exist on your target table. If that's, if that's not the case, you would then receive an, an error. Uh, the nice thing about this is where you, you can actually insert and select and update and delete all at the same. Um, you can, there is options in your connection options for each of the create table, create user mapping and create server. You would have options to say up or updatable or I think it's updatable. Where, so there you can say, there you can set the read-only property. So on a server level, so this is a read-only server, so anything below that, it, cas it cascades to anything below that. So for the user, it can be updatable, yes or no, and then for the table, on a table level or an object level, it can be updatable, yes or no, as well. So now you have like 600 or whatever, 1,000 tables that you need to import onto your source database. Now Postgres, uh, the FDW actually gives you an option that says you can import a foreign schema. So not just one table or one column, you can actually import the whole public schema from all of your databases into, your, into one current database. So there's a, just there at the bottom, there's a, a list of examples where the first one is you would say import foreign schema. I want to import the public schema from your server into your current schema, so uh, into, your, into a schema that exists on your DB. Second example is you can import a foreign schema, but only limited to table one or table two, table three, and then you would just pass through a CSV of table names, or you can say import everything except table two and table four. And um, so, and that is post, there's a whole list of things that you can still do with Postgres FDW, but just want to leave a little bit more time for Q&A. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry, just before you ask a question, can you just uh, wait for the microphone before you ask your question? Are there any questions? Sorry, here at the front. Uh, yeah, that um, import foreign schema part, very interesting. Does it build the table type, the, the table structures for you? Yes, it does. Even if you go from a, a foreign database like Oracle or DB2 or MySQL? I haven't, or uh, yeah, as I said, I've only just discovered the Oracle and Redis and all that okay. stuff of DB. So I'm sure, it, uh, it I don't be, know if the if import... it's JDBC, it should be able to, yeah. Yes, I'm not sure if the import foreign schema is available for the... Um, for your different databases like MySQL and Oracle. Okay, but, thanks. Okay. Uh, second question, you, you, you said create extension module name. What is that module? Is that module name is the actual extension. Um, so yeah, but, but is it a C executable that you have to write or can you do it in Java? What, what's the support? Oh, the actual, if you want to the, write your own extension. Yeah. Um, I think that would have to be, because Postgres is written in C, so I'm probably sure C. probably C, uh, the, uh, what's it, Piotr, Piotr, the guy that we had, the PG threads, he did his extension in C, so I'm, I'm gonna go with it. <laughs> okay, yes. thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much, guys. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs> <laughs>